Ladies and gents, welcome. So, I've got a treat for you today. Thank you for clicking play. Um, carronade. What is a carronade? So, a carronade is a type of naval armament that was coined in roughly the 1770s by the Carron Iron Works up in Falkirk in Scotland. So, a, a carronade typically is, is a name given to a, a short barreled naval orientated muzzle loading, I suppose you would call it a cannon, um, of, of the, the, the mid to late Georgian era. Um, now, these guns initially were heavily mistrusted by the, the Royal Navy purely for the fact that they'd had dealings with the Caron Ironworks before without a great deal of success. I believe there was a bit of a, a project blunder early on in the relationship between this particular foundry and the British Royal Navy, um, and relationships were soured for some time. However, by 1770s, 1780s, this type of naval gun was being considered more and more for frontline duty, um, and, and really proved to be fairly useful over the decades to come. So, if, if we talk about the, the lifespan of a, a carronade, we're, we're talking 1770s up until about 1850, you know, at a very, very stretched out level. So, by the 1850, the nature of naval gunnery was changing, you know, rather than seeing round shot fired from a boat, um, you, you, you're getting into the realms of exploding shells, rifled guns, and larger calibers than carronades would previously be bored in. So, what I find very interesting, the last recorded use of a carronade in battle was during the First Boer War, whereby the, 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 the Boers strapped one of these types of barrel to a, a cart axle and fired upon the British with it. Probably not particularly successfully, but well obsolete by, by the late uh, 19th century however, still dangerous enough to be considered as a threat. So, if we look at the design of the carronade, so th this piece here is what's known as a 32 pounder. So this doesn't refer to the weight of the barrel. The barrel is actually in the region of 900 kilos. The 32 pound aspect refers to the size of shot, i.e. the cannonball that this piece fires, which is around six inches of solid iron weighing in the region of 32 pounds, hence the name. So, this barrel here is 1.6 metres in length from the back of the casket bell to the front of the muzzle. And you might think, oh, that's, that's short for a 32 pounder. Bearing in mind that a naval long 32 pounder is in the region of nine and a half feet. So, there's a number of reasons for this. The, the, the carronade albeit a short gun, was very light for its size. So, as I've said, 900 kilos versus roughly three tons for a 32 pound long gun. Now, I think you can start to see how useful this gun is, bearing in mind it packs a wallop, it fires at a 32 pound ball. However, it weighs roughly the same as a six pound long gun, slightly less, if anything. So, I think by the end of the 18th century, the Navy were starting to rearm their, their smaller type vessels, their sloops, um, with this new type of gun, purely for the fact that the weight of its broadside would be much increased. So, on, on a naval vessel, obviously, a, a great deal of the weight high up in the ship's um, decks. Um, would be from its, its, its gunnery, you know, and, and as vessels like the, the Mary Rose can testify, um, keeping too much mass above the centre of mass of a boat can be quite dangerous at times and, and can lead to a great deal of instability. So the carronade really was, was designed to try and take some of the weight out of a vessel that may have previously been armed with longer, thicker type guns or to bolster the broadside of a vessel that would have been armed with smaller calibre, six pound, nine pound long guns. 
Now, as, as well as the reduction in length, you'll also notice that the, the thickness of the bore of this carronade, i.e. The, the skin that it's cast in, is, is greatly reduced versus a long gun. Um, two, two real reasons for this. By the, the mid to late Georgian era, metallurgy was improving, the, the consistency of, of grey iron was on the up. Um, so, you know, your, 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 your grain structure and the, the, the strength and ductility of the material was becoming more of a fine science and probably more dependable. So these carronade type guns being thinner would not be open to loading procedures such as double shotting, which is very common with long guns of the era, whereby a single powder charge and two solid round shot could be loaded. It's not something you'd want to do in a gun like this. A gun like this would fire a single round shot, a, a keg of canister, bar shot, chain shot, langrish, all of the, the, the typical naval types of projectile available to, to the Georgian Navy, but you would not want to be doubling up on loads because you are quite liable to burst the gun. So if, if we have a look at the, the architecture of the gun, the first thing you'll probably notice is it hasn't got any trunnions. So the, the trunnions are the protrusions at the side of the barrel, typically sitting somewhere about halfway up. And these, these are what allows a, a traditional type of naval barrel to be mounted to a, a carriage, a double-cheeked carriage. Now, one of the major improvements in design that these carronades brought forward was the addition of this cast loop on the underside of the gun. Now, what we have to bear in mind is this barrel is actually upside down on the trolleys currently to allow me to show you a bit more of its design detail. Now, this loop would have had a, a bar stretching it through its underside, sticking out, and on the end of the bar would be clamped two cast iron mounts. So essentially the gun pivoted from its very bottom. This, this allowed the carriage to be narrower, so if you consider the angle of fire aboard the vessel to be greatly increased with a narrower carriage, you can also consider the, the longitudinal pivoting ability of the barrel to be greatly increased as well. So rather than having trunnions and uh, a wooden coin wedge at the back of a traditional carriage whereby your angle of fire is fairly limited, this gun was, was greatly more versatile in both lateral and longitudinal adjustment. Now, if I show you the back end of the gun, <laughs> The second feature, which is fairly unusual, is the makeup of the casket bowl. So bear in mind once again, this, this barrel is actually upside down. So this, this ring here we recognise, this is typical of a British Blomfield pattern of gun. So this is where traditionally you would pass a breaching rope through to try and restrain and constrain the recoil of the gun upon firing. However, what we also have on the very back of the cascabel is more akin to a, a gun of the Russian Empire for those who have seen pictures. Now this was not for passing a breaching rope through, this was actually for the use of a, an elevation screw. And probably the best example I can give you of this is if you look at a, a modern machine tool like a lathe, you have a, a long lead screw with a trapezoidal or acme type thread. That is a, a fairly coarse fast-turning thread, unlike a, a screw or a bolt. Um, and rather than using a wooden wedge to elevate the barrel, quite often on a naval carriage, there would be a long lead screw with infinite adjustment, much more precise. So a, a marked improvement, um, and probably something that was more repeatable versus using the, the, the wooden coin of, of previous carriages. Um, the carriages that constrain this type of barrel were not as we spoke about with long guns. They were not double-cheeked type carriages. They were often sliding carriages. So the bottom of the mounts that sat either side of the cast loop would attach to a flat board, roughly yay long, which would have pivoted on another board of slightly greater length. 
So if you consider it to be two sliding blocks, the purpose of these blocks was to try and dampen some of the recoil forces that the gun saw upon firing. Rather than using wheels and a large breaching rope, this design of carriage could cash in on friction between two wooden surfaces um, and, and really a, a allowed the probably quite shockingly bad recoil of a, a light 32 pounder like this to be somewhat overcome. Now, I guess another advantage of A, this type of carriage and B, the gun's weight, it can be worked by a much smaller crew, maybe four or five men versus probably, you know, the eight to 12 that would have been taken to man a 32 pound long gun with a, a you know, a, a three ton plus payload in weight. So simplicity really here was the name of the game. Cheap, light and easy to, to crew. Hence why these guns were not just limited to the Royal Navy, they were also used in numbers aboard merchant Navy vessels for, for the aforementioned reasons. So, I guess the, the next point really, how effective was the carronade? Now, if, if, you to, if you were to read online and try and familiarize yourself with this, you know, this, this design of gun, um, there is one key event in history that, uh, that we can talk about. So, probably the defining moment of the carronade in its history comes during the Battle of Trafalgar. So on the 21st of October, 1805, HMS Victory, the forecastle of which was armed with two 68 pound smoothbore carronades. So to put that into perspective, this is a 32 pound gun. This is a large carronade. The 68 pounders aboard Victory were ginormous and not very common in either naval or merchant use. Now, Victory's opening salvo during the Battle of Trafalgar came when um, the Victory sailed up the back of the French vessel Bucantere, which was an 80-gun ship of the line. So no meagre vessel of its time, really. And whilst loading the round shot in one of Victory's 68-pounders, a Royal Marine grabbed a canister of 500 musket balls, so what comes to be known as canister shot, and also loaded these on top of the 68 pound round shot. So as Victory sailed up the back of the Boucon Terre, she came in line with the vessel's stern windows, which I'm sure as you've seen from films depicting the age, was a large window full of small panels of glass, beyond which were the gun decks of Boucon Terre, each in line with guns, men, and activity. So upon firing her 68 pounder loaded with canister, Victory in one shot killed and maimed almost a half of Boucanter's crew and very much took a great deal of, of guns and men out of action just in one shot. Now, Although not impossible to fire a canister from a long gun, you would not be finding guns of 68 pound size aboard the forecastle or quarter deck of any ship of the line, purely for the fact that they would be much too heavy and the center of mass of the boat would be unstable. So I can tell the question you probably all want to ask, where the hell did I get hold of this carronade from? And it's a good question. So, when you can't sleep at night, obviously you peruse the internet online for stupid purchases that you can make. Uh, one thing that popped up a few months back was a carronade, about 60 miles from home in, a, in an architectural salvage yard. So that immediately got me thinking. Um, and a couple of days later, I went over to have a look, took some measurements, had a, a good look over the condition and thought, yeah, this, this is the gun for me. So. It had actually been advertised as a 68 pounder, which is clearly not true. So I'm assuming that, you know, the, the, the bore size was probably a point of contention. Um, I managed to, to hire a, a van and along with the, the engine crane and some fairly primitive homemade trolleys, actually brought the gun back um, home. 
So what I then had to do was try and devise a way to, to lift the gun out of the back of the van, bearing in mind the barrel is very short. So, I mean, loading it in the van was fairly easy. We had a, a forklift truck to hand, so you know, lifting the 900 odd kilos wasn't too difficult, but trying to do the reverse without a forklift or a high up arm at home proved to be rather difficult, but not impossible. So we, we did manage to get the barrel off in the end with uh, some fairly fancy craning and uh, actually ended up driving the van out from underneath the gun in the end, which was quite amusing. Um, but, you know, crucially, she's, she's home now. Um, the, the, the first thing that became very obvious when looking down the bore of the gun was there is still a ball in there. Now, uh, I asked the owners of the, of the salvage yard What's, what's that all about? And uh, you'll, you'll like this. They, they told me the previous owner had put it there himself. And uh, I kind of said, oh, okay, thank you. Um, all all to the, you know, the, the wonderment that he'd managed to also put a lot of sea concretion down the barrel, um, which to me really, really struck home that this gun is C recovered and is still loaded potentially with a powder charge behind the ball so th this is something that we'll need dealing with you know um the gun can't remain loaded as um it's non-functioning and the point of having a, a gun like this really is to have it up and running not that it will ever be used but the first thing people will always ask you is does it work and it's always nicer to be able to say Yes. So, once I've got the gun, it niggled at me for weeks and weeks. Where, where does it come from? You know, it, it's, it's sea recovered, it's ended up in the UK and it's still loaded. So has it gone down in action? Has it gone down cleared for action? What, what's, the, what's the story? Um, I'm actually a, a member of a, a, a Canon forum on Facebook and I was sitting there one evening and saw a post from um, a historic divers page and they, they'd shared a post from a Northampton diving club who dived the wreck of a vessel named HMS Primrose in the mid to late 1970s and through some weeks of research I was able to get hold of um, a couple of the original divers from the Northampton diving club um, who were absolutely marvellous gents and shared lots of pictures and information with me and what it transpired is that five of these carronades had been brought up from the wreck of HMS Primrose back in the mid to late 1970s. Now Primrose was a type of vessel known as a, 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 a cruiser class brig sloop so a two-masted 18-gun vessel, that would be 16 32-pound carronades and two six-pound long chase guns. Now, Primrose was actually sunk off the uh, a rock formation known as the Manacles, roughly a mile offshore from the Lizard Peninsula down in Cornwall. Um, Primrose was actually built in, in Fowey, so didn't venture far from where she was sunk. However, she did see action off the coast of Spain in 1808. So as you can see with snow on the ground, this is December in the UK. It's not all that frequent that we get snow, but let me tell you, it's very cold running a jet wash outside when your trousers are sodden with water. So the first thing really was to try and get some of the mud off the inside of the gun's bore and around the bore. Um, try and catch some of the low-hanging fruit if you like and make our job a bit easier. After which it was a matter of trying to pick away at the vent which was absolutely caked with mud and concretion. Um, the mole grips are simply on there to try and give the, the screwdriver a bit of twist and as you can see here the vent went through fairly easily without too much of a, a hassle. So the idea with picking the vent out early was to try and wet the back of the ball as well as the front in an effort to soften some of the concretion that had formed around it from both sides. Um, as you can see here there is a bit of a black tinge to the water coming out which can only be black powder. 
So next was a, a masonry drill bit on the end of two extensions attached to a small SDS drill. And the idea of this was to try and drill as many small holes as possible to try and eat away at and weaken the concretion that had formed at the face of the bore. Now this stuff was actually relatively soft compared to what lay behind. And then we see a, a cold chisel welded to a piece of quarter inch angle iron. Um, I went through three or four different iterations of picks welded to bars before I found something that would actually be strong enough to use. And there was many, many hours of uh, chiseling away, trying to force a gap between the ball and the gun's bore, um, literally millimetres at a time. Um, some evenings were very slow progress and, and others went a bit quicker. But I, I dread to think how many thousands of blows were involved with, uh, with picking this out. So the next stage, once we'd forced a gap between the ball and the bore, was to start using a reciprocating air saw, as you can see here. Now, this was excellent with coarser blades. So what I was really doing was trying to cut away at the concretion, um, which really was as hard as granite in places. You, you could spend you know, two hours an evening after work sawing at this stuff and only probably move a millimeter two at a push. Um, the jet washing that you could see there was really to try and keep the powder charge wet. Um, obviously a stray spark from a reciprocating saw could be disastrous so every five or ten minutes it was a matter of firing at the jet wash and trying to wet that powder charge. So once I'd got around two-thirds of the circumference around the ball I kind of thought that it would be time to try and lever the ball away from the gun and that's exactly what I was able to do with the, the cold chisel setup that you saw a moment ago. Um, there was a subtle change in sound on one of the hammer blows and that's when I knew the ball had struck loose from the bore. Um, what you can see here is really the, the final stages of two months of work, chiseling, sawing and washing in using a long crowbar to just jimmy the ball down the barrel, trying to use its own weight under gravity to roll it where possible. But, uh, this, this really was the culmination of many 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 weeks of work part-time um late nights and wet trousers so i think the uh, the elation as i knew it was coming to an end and this would be the evening um really was quite something hence why you can see me working for about an hour hour and a half here without a break and let me tell you i was dripping with sweat by the end but once the bits between your teeth you know you you you, you carry on So now that a lot of the hard concretion has gone from the wad, I've uh, rather poetically swapped to the worming tool from my swivel gun. So hopefully this will allow me to get right into the back of the chamber where it tapers. And um, just goes to show sometimes there is no substitute for the old way.
So as you can see, we can't be far off now. The breech end of the gun has started to drip. Bear in mind this barrel is upside down on the trolley, which can only mean one thing. The jet wash has made it through to the vent. So I think we're nearly there. So guys, as you can see, we've now reached the back of the gun. Everything is out. So what we've got here, the further I got towards the back of the wadding, the more it became rope-like to the point where you can actually see quite long strands of it. And this stuff was quite hard to pick away at as there's still a remarkable amount of tensile strength in this rope, even after 200 odd years. Now, on the top of all this, this integrated wadding is what looks to be black powder corns. So the amount of charge that was left after we washed out the vent. So just as well, we didn't use any heat and made sure we kept it wet. So behind the, the wadding and in and amongst the black powder, as thought, we found some pieces of what looked to be linen cartridge bag. So I should imagine the rest of this probably rotted away as the, the nitrates in the gunpowder mixed with seawater probably are not the kindest to fabrics over 200 odd years. But I'm really pleased to have found these two pieces. So now I need to get them rinsed in some distilled water and uh, have a, a little read up on how best to preserve these really as they are from what I can make out the only two pieces. Um, I'm, I'm quite glad in ways that I found a traditional linen cartridge bag or the remnants of as once again I'd, I'd read accounts whereby carronades had a, um, a woolen powder bag um, I believe the idea of which was to avoid having to worm and sponge the gun between firings so I should imagine that the powder bag was somehow fire resistant or albeit fire resistant for perhaps a period of seconds giving enough time for the gun to be loaded and fired without the worry of an immediate detonation of the fresh charge as you would with a linen powder bag if there were burning embers still in the barrel so as i've said before you know i think the reason for this is that this gun's been recovered from a royal navy vessel not a merchant boat these were trained gunners of the the highest pedigree you know, gunnery techniques were reaching their pinnacle by the late Georgian era. And I think worming, wadding, sponging guns was absolutely common practice aboard naval vessels. You know, probably with no room for discussion. Hi guys, before I go any further, I thought I'd take the time to give you a look at the cannonball that was removed from the bore. Now it's had a few days soaking in sodium hydroxide, Corsic soda, the same sort of crystal as you use to unblock drains with. So the ball is around six inches in diameter, which denotes it as a 32 pounder. So a, a carronade's bore is roughly 0.1 of an inch bigger than the cannonball. So the ball is cast the same size as the bore and upon cooling contracts roughly 0.1 of an inch to produce a lovely tight clearance, hence why it was a right bugger to remove. So as you can see on the ball here, on the back end there are some remnants of the concretion, which is a, a chemical reaction between seawater and iron that forms this very dense, very hard calcification on, on the surface of an iron object. And it, it's this that really fused the ball into the bore of the gun and made it so utterly difficult to remove. So this stuff is hard, but not brittle for the most part. And the strange thing is that the density of it varies depending on the location on which it's formed. Now, on a cannonball, you would probably say that's, you know, something to do with the, 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 the density and the porosity of the casting. You know, metallurgy back in the Georgian era was not a finite art. And it's quite likely that in some areas, this ball's concretion is probably going to be a lot tougher than others. And from picking the ball out of the bore, I would say that's definitely true. Some evenings I could make only a mil or two of progress. 
other evenings maybe half an inch an inch so interesting now the front of this ball obviously was exposed to the d d desalination treatment that the barrel went through some years ago to remove the, the chloride ions from the cannonball to stop it rotting now that we've exposed it to oxygen. However, the back end of the ball over here has been sat in probably a mixture of old muddy seawater and just as bad, the potassium nitrate in the gunpowder. Very salty stuff will corrode the bore of a gun or a ball even before it's fired. So what we need to do with this is give it as long as we can stomach in fresh water, rainwater ideally, as it doesn't, you know, have fluoride, chlorine, magnesium, all the things that are put into tap water. Um, and just to help the process along, we're going to add a little bit more caustic soda just to make the, the water solution a, a weak alkali, which will help to draw the chloride ions out of the ball. So some preservation needed. Unfortunately, if we were to just dry this out and paint it, there is every chance it would start to crumble. And once it starts, it will not stop. So we, we owe it to the ball to try and preserve it as best we can, as um, it's, it's, it's come from a, a fairly prevalent source. Um, and we'll, we'll, once preserved, we'll, we'll do another part of the video in future and let you have a look at the final product. Thanks for watching guys, be sure to join us in the next part where we'll begin to look more into the Primrose story um, and we'll also be thinking about building a carriage for the gun and for the restoration of the barrel. So don't forget to like and subscribe to our social media pages and I look forward to seeing you next time.